Chapter 44 There were still some hours of daylight left for travel. So, after a quick meal, Will and Horace remounted and pushed on after the outsiders. Sensing that in the days to come he would have a need for concealment, Horace was now eager to experiment with the camouflage cloak that Holt had given him. This became a source of some annoyance for Will as they followed the trail through the tree-covered dales. From time to time, when they were passing small clumps of trees or bushes, Horace would rein and kick it beside them, pull his cowl forward, wrap the cloak around himself, and attempt to sit without any movement. Can you see me now? he would ask. Sighing, Will would pretend to search for him, thinking that his friend, the foremost knight in the kingdom of Araluen, a warrior who would be feared and respected on any battlefield, was behaving like an overgrown child with a new toy. I can just make you out, he would say through gritted teeth, at which Horace would ride a few metres further away and repeat his freezing-in-place exercise. How about now? he would ask expectantly. Knowing that if he didn't provide the answer Horace wanted to hear, they would go through this procedure another half-dozen times, Will would nod his head slowly, as if in wonder. Amazing, he would say, if I didn't know you were there. He paused, looking for a way to end that statement, and finished rather lamely, I wouldn't know you were there. Which in itself was true, although... If Horace had analysed the statement in any depth, he might have realised that Will had effectively said nothing. But it seemed to satisfy him for the time being. Shortly before nightfall, Will was intently studying the tracks left by the outsiders. Even though he felt relatively safe following them, it didn't hurt to keep a careful watch for any sign of an ambush. And with the failing light, he had to concentrate a little harder. He had dismounted to look more closely at several signs when he was interrupted by yet another questioning call from Horace. Will? Without turning towards him, Will replied through slightly gritted teeth. Yes, Horace. Can you see me now? No, I can't see you at all, Horace, Will said continuing to check on a line of footprints that led away from the trail, through the grass and behind a leafy bush. A few seconds' examination showed that the diversion and subsequent concealment had been for personal hygiene reasons, rather than any sinister intent. You're not looking! The voice was insistent. At the previous year's harvest festival on Seacliff Island, Will had watched a small child swinging enthusiastically on a wood and rope swing set up in the play area, all the while shouting imperiously to her father, Daddy! Daddy! Look at me! Look at me! He was reminded of that now as he turned to see Horace and Kicker standing relatively motionless in front of a large, leafy bush. Horace, he said wearily, you're sitting on top of a great Big brown battle horse. It's nearly two metres high and three metres long, and it weighs a quarter of a ton. Of course I can see you. Horace looked crestfallen. He glanced down at the massive form of Kicker, motionless beneath him. It was difficult for a battle horse to remain inconspicuous, he realised. Oh, he said, disappointment evident in his voice. But if Kicker weren't here, could you see me then? A little hard to answer, Horace, Will said, because Kicker is there, and it's hard to ignore him. He sort of draws the eye, and that goes against the whole concept of camouflage and concealment, you see. Horace chewed his lip thoughtfully. Will couldn't resist the temptation. I saw that. You chewed your lip. Horace made an impatient gesture. He had considered that moment to be in the nature of a time-out. "'Saw that too,' Will said relentlessly. 
If you want to remain unseen, you have to avoid chewing your lip and waving your arm. And it's best if you don't sit on top of a whacking great battle horse while you're doing it. All right, I suppose so, Horace said. There was a slight tone of annoyance in his voice. But if you use your imagination... You want me to imagine Kicker isn't here? Will asked him. That's right, Horace replied, determined not to be put off by the sarcasm in Will's voice. If he wasn't here, could you see me then? Will suddenly had the sense that they could be here for hours. He sighed heavily. Well, if I imagined Kicker isn't here, then I would find it exceedingly difficult to see you, Horace. Thought so, Horace said, with a satisfied smile. Particularly since you'd appear to be floating two metres in the air, Will continued in a mutter. What was that? Horace asked suspiciously. I said you'd appear not to be anywhere, Will said, thinking quickly. And Horace nodded, satisfied once more. Will thought it might be a good idea to change the subject. Let's push on for a few more hours before we stop for the night, he suggested. Horace shrugged agreeably. Suits me, he said. Then he added as an afterthought. Are you sure you won't lose track of me? I could just disappear in the dark. I'll do my best, Will said. Just for a moment, he wished his friend would disappear. They had a cold camp that night and rose at dawn to continue. They were drawing closer to their quarry now, assuming that the cave complex was Tennyson's planned destination. Horace abandoned his light-hearted attempts at concealment and became far more businesslike in his approach. It occurred to Will, as it had to halt in recent times, that Horace might well have been engaging in a subtle piece of leg-pulling with all this can-you-see-me-now antics. Horace had years of leg-pulling and practical jokes to make up, and Will had the uncomfortable suspicion that the tall warrior had been secretly chuckling to himself the day before. The ground began to rise now as they found themselves heading for the line of hills. The trees were fewer and farther between, and they moved carefully, conscious that there could be hidden watchers observing their approach. But there was no sign that they had been seen, and eventually the ground levelled out into a plateau, leading to the foot of the hills proper. The trees grew more thickly as the ground levelled out and the two friends reined in, concealed by the shadows of a large grove, surveying the open ground that remained before them. Just a few hundred metres distant, the hills rose into the sky, steep and forbidding, a natural barrier. There was no sign of Tennyson or any of his followers. Nobody here, Horace muttered. Nobody we can see, Will amended. He was peering closely at the base of the hills. The sun was sinking in the west, and even though it threw direct light on the hills, the irregular folds of the sandstone created patches of light and shade, and several darker patches could well have marked the entrance to the caves. Or they could have just been deeper shadows. Will had a sudden concern that Tennyson hadn't stopped here after all, that he had continued, maybe climbing the hills through some as yet unseen pass, and was now heading away on the far side of the ranges. Yet, reason told him, the outsider leader could have done that at any time in the past few weeks. He had headed specifically for this range, where, according to the map, there was a large number of caves. If he'd wanted to simply disappear into the east, he could have done so without the difficulty of having to find a way over the hills. And now that he could see them, Will realised they were closer to cliffs than hills, and finding a way across them would be difficult indeed. Horace nudged him with his elbow. Smell that? Will raised his head and sniffed the air experimentally. He caught the very slightest scent of wood smoke on the air. 
It was faint, but it was definitely there. They're here all right. They're starting to get dinner ready, Horace said. But where? Will asked, scanning the cliff faces once more. Then Horace touched his arm and pointed. Look, he said. There's a tree growing at an angle from the face of the cliff, about ten metres up. He waited until Will nodded that he could see it. Then he held his hand out at arm's length, squinting with one eye closed, and held up first one finger, then two vertically. Then he folded the second finger down again. To the left of the tree, about one and a half fingers, there's a cleft, in the rock. Will mimicked the action of holding the fingers up and sighting down them. It was a simple but effective way of providing directions, and he soon saw the cleft Horace had spotted. A thin grey ribbon of smoke issued from it. The faint breeze grabbed it almost immediately and dissipated it. But it was there. And so, he realised, was Tennyson. They're in the caves, he said, and Horace nodded. We're going to have to get closer to take a look, Will said, scanning the ground in front of them. There was plenty of low cover, but not enough to conceal Tug and Kicker. We'll have to leave the horses here and push forward. You're planning to go into the caves? Horace said, his voice very level. Will glanced at him. Since they had been small children, Horace had disliked confined spaces. It was one of the reasons that he never wore a full-face helmet, preferring the simple cone-shaped cap. When they were younger, Will had used the fact to escape him on numerous occasions. I'll need you to keep an eye on things outside, he said, and saw Horace's shoulder slump in relief. You're sure? he asked. I'll come with you if you really need me. Will reached over and squeezed his shoulder. I appreciate the offer, he said. But it'll be easier for me to move around inside without being seen. All right then, Horace said. I can't say I'm disappointed. Besides, Will couldn't resist saying, with your newfound camouflage skills, I'd probably lose you in there.